Welcome to Fellowship Church. I'm Ed Young, lead pastor, and it's great to have all of you here in all of our different environments. You know, we're one church in many locations. Well, I've been in a series called Breath, and today I'm talking about breath that is recorded. I'm talking about the actual breath of God. When I was 15 years old, I met a beautiful young lady at church. She's now my wife. And she sent me this, this love letter. And this love letter was special. In fact, it was so special, I read the love letter and read it over and over. And, and let me just read to you an excerpt of this letter. It's it, it, it's it's. Whoa, it's still hot. Whoa, it's still hot. And, and it said, Dearest Edwin B., you are super fantastic, and I love you. All of my love, Lisa. And she sprayed some cologne on it. Charlie. Cologne. I read that and reread that because it was a love letter. I grew up in the dirty South, spent a lot of time in South Carolina. As a kid, we, we lived off of a dirt road for a while. I really loved the setting, the beautiful pine trees, and, and, and just it was kind of outdoorsy, you know, and across the road, there was, a, there was a lake, and one evening, Dad took my brother and I down to the shores, and you know, we're throwing rocks and stuff in the lake, and, and, and suddenly we saw a snake, and then we saw another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. For some reason, I don't know if it was mating season or what, the bank was crawling with water moccasins. We had a little flashlight, and I'll never forget what Dad told me. He said, son, jump on my back. Son, get on my back. I'll carry you out. He put the, the flashlight on, and I can still see it flickering, and, and, and he would carefully step with my brother and I on his back. We made it through the woods all the way home. Wow, that was scary. I spent a lot of time outdoors. I've never seen that many snakes in my life in one area. Lisa and I have had Dobermans for a while. Now we have one. The other one has, has passed on. I've had this Bible for a long time. In fact, my, my mother gave me this Bible when we opened the doors of this facility in 1998. I usually preach from this Bible. And anyway, the other day, our Doberman was in my office at home, and he ate part of the book of Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm going to show you. I even saved it. Jeremiah, Jeremiah. There it is, Jeremiah. Oh, yeah, look, look. He ate it. And I was upset at Dutch, but... Can you really get that upset at a Doberman? I was in Africa a couple of years ago in a place called Johannesburg, Pretoria, Bloemfontein. And between some speaking engagements, the pastor of a church took Lisa and I out to this zoo. Now, a zoo in Africa is the real deal. I mean, there are all sorts of things, you know. They don't have the, the lawyers and, and all of the sometimes ridiculous laws we have about animals and protection and all that. I mean, they're fine, but some of it is over the top, as you know. You get up close and personal. I want to apologize to the lawyers. You get up close and personal to all these animals. And it was fascinating to see these things. In fact, one guy put us into this, in this acreage. It was fenced off. And there were cheetahs just lying around, wild. 
and he would come up to them, and, and, he, and, he, and he, okay, just stick your hand out and pet the cheetah, and we actually petted the cheetah, and you'll see it on the side screen. That's Lisa and I petting this cheetah, and you could hear him purr. It, 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 was, it was crazy, the, the zoo, the zoo. All the things I just described to you, all of the stories I just told to you have to do with the subject matter that I'm talking about today. They have to do with the Bible. The Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, the Bible is the very breath of God. Right now, you're hearing the breath of Ed. My breath is moving over my vocal cords. My vocal cords are vibrating. You hear the breath of Ed. We have the breath of God in the Bible. We have the breath of God. We have a record of the breath of God. People say, well, I wish God could speak to me audibly about my relationships. I wish God would speak to me about, about my, my economic condition. I wish God would really speak to me about my job, about how to parent. I wish God would speak to me because should I forgive this person or not? He already has. His word is written down. The breath of God has been recorded. All we have to do is breathe it in. The Bible is literally God's breath because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the word breathe, God breathed, is literally theonoustos. Say it with me. Theonoustos, it means God breathed. Here's what the scripture says. All scripture is God breathed, theonoustos, and is used for teaching what we should do right, rebuking what is not right, correcting how to really do what's right in all situations, and training in righteousness. That is the Bible. What's so crazy about the Bible is the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. No book comes close to the Bible, not even close. My favorite author is John Grisham. I like most of his books. I think it would be great to sit down with John Grisham and talk with John Grisham, have coffee with John Grisham, maybe share a cup of hot cocoa together with John Grisham so I can read his book. And I could just kind of talk to him, ask him questions about, hey, that character, how do you develop that? Where did you get that idea? I can't do that. I don't know John Grisham. When I read the Bible, it's the only book where the author is all around me and in me because I've inhaled the breath of God and I'm breathing the breath of God and I'm reading and understanding the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. You know the Bible says that about itself in the Old Testament 4,000 times the word of God. So it's the breath of God. The breath of God is the word of God. 4,000 times it's the word of God. In the New Testament, 44 times it says the Word of God. So we have the Word of God. And when we started fellowship 25 years ago, we said, okay, we are going to be a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. It's that simple. That's who we are. That's what we are. We have no man-made creed, no group in Nashville or Paraguay telling us what to do. We're a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. So when anyone ever asks you, hey, what kind of church is Fellowship Church? We're a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. The Bible is the Word of God, and it teaches us about God, and we worship the God of the Word. Some people, though, over the years, because the Bible is by far the best-selling book of all time, it is also the most dissected and the most maligned book of all time. It has, it has survived burnings and bans. People right now, right now, are dying for the word of God, for the breath of God. Evil people are taking the lives of Christians 
And sadly, our government, so many leaders in our government are just turning their head the other way. They're sticking their heads in the sands of denials. They will not call it what it is, a war between good and evil, a war against the Word of God, a war against Christianity. And it's time that we have some leaders, some men and women in Washington to stand up and to speak truth and to say, you know what? Our nation was founded on the Word of God and we're going to protect people who were persecuted and killed by evil. Somebody help me preach. So we've tried to to deny that the Bible is the Word of God. I I talked to someone a couple of months ago, and this person was telling me, oh, I've got problems with the Bible. Well, very, very quickly, I asked him some basic questions about the Bible. He didn't know jack about the Bible. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, so you deny Scripture? He's like, yeah, yeah. I just think the Bible's been tweaked over time. It's been changed, you know, blah, 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 what? everyone says, who has a vested interest in keeping God out of their grill. The more I talked to him, though, I discovered he'd been messing around on his wife. And I'm like, oh, I got it now. I got it now. See, you've you've got a vested interest in keeping God out of your business. So we deny it. We watch one little show or hear one little Dr. Fuzzy Face give us a lecture at the local university and say, oh, the Bible. Hey, the Bible is the most accurate, ancient piece of literature ever. For example, take take the words of Plato or Aristotle. Take their works. You got barely 10 copies of the New Testament alone. We have over 14. 15,000 copies. So if you just take the classical historical method and put it to the test and put scripture to the test, it passes with flying colors. Archaeology is behind the Bible. Geography is behind the Bible. Science is behind the Bible. So if you really want to discover and know all the stats and the minutia, We have amazing resource centers at all of our campuses. So all you got to do is go back there, and I have a list of some books that I would like for you to pick up, or you you can do that online. Well, the Bible, though, speaks for itself. It's like... It's like that lion that I I saw in Africa. I mean, you just let the lion roar, brother. I mean, the lion is a lion is a lion. It's the Bible. Yet we've tried to deny it. People try to distort it. They they take different verses out of context and build weird and wacky theologies around verses out of context. Because whenever you take a verse out of context, you can you can make the Bible say anything you want. Well, you've got to take it in context. You got to look at it from history, from the setting, the author, and take the totality of it. Here are just some 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 things that you might find interesting about the Bible. Nelson Gluick, renowned Jewish archaeologist, says it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. William F. Albright, archaeologist, quote, there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of Old Testament tradition. Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict, quote, the Bible compared with any other ancient writings has more manuscript evidence than any 10 pieces of classical literature combined, unquote. (laughs) McDowell also writes, after trying to shatter the historicity and validity of scriptures, I came to the conclusion that it is historically trustworthy. If one discards the Bible as being unreliable, then he must discard almost all literature of antiquity. So don't you see how, how people kind of have a vested interest in denying and distorting the Bible? People say all the time, well, I'm going to have a Bible study. 
I just wanna have a Bible study. No, you don't need another Bible study. You need to allow the Bible to study you. You see, the Bible is not a textbook. The Bible is not something we worship. The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible was written by 40 different authors over the course of 1,500 years on different continents, and, and, and the miraculous, supernatural thing about it is it all tells the same story, the Word of God. God cannot lie. There's not a lie in God's Word. And we believe in the original autographs, the Bible is the infallible, inerrant Word of God. It is our only standard of living. Yet people still, oh man, I wanna, I wanna keep my distance from that. And then, then, then we distort stuff. We dissect stuff in the Bible. And, and then some people do this. Hmm, wow, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that verse about, about bringing the whole tithe into the, into the storehouse. I'm just gonna take that part out of the Bible. I don't, I don't like tithing, what? I mean, the first portion of my income should go to the local church. Oh, man, there, there, there it is again in Malachi. I, I, no, uh, I, I don't like that. I don't like that. Oh, okay. Um, envy? Envy? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't like that. Envy. Uh, <laughs> well, see... My God is a forgiving God. And even though I'm having sex outside of marriage, everything is cool. I mean, God just wants to, I don't like that sex outside of marriage. No, I. Isn't it fascinating how we tear apart the Bible, how we edit the Bible ourselves, how so many people do that? Why? Because the Bible is the only book that when we read it, it reads us. The Bible, the <laughs> breath of God. The Bible is a love letter. I mean, it's, it's a love letter. Lisa wrote that love letter to me. I read it over and over. That's what the scripture is. Jeremiah 31 says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. It's God's irresistible, one of a kind love that draws us to him. This Bible is, is a love letter and it's packed with different aspects of who I am, of whose I am, of, of what kind of God that made me of what kind of God I serve. It tells me how to live my life in every single area. There's no book like it. It's a love letter. The Bible's also a light. Maybe you're like, okay, man, I'm surrounded by water moxes right now. This addiction is messing me up. This, 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 this depression, depression is getting the best of me. Man, this person has betrayed me and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm waiting to get them back. I don't know what step to take next. I mean, where do I go as I negotiate the maze of life? Well, Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp, it illuminates, right, to my feet. Think about water moccasins, I'm, I'm back with dad, and a light for my path. So it illuminates, the word does, and it penetrates. When you drive at night, you know, you're, you're out there at night, you, you turn your headlights on, and your headlights only reveal to you a certain amount of the freeway or the road. Yet you have faith to keep on going. It gives you just enough light to keep on going. And that's the Bible. We read the Bible, we, we digest the Bible, and man, we see how to live. The Bible is a love letter, it's a light, it's also a lunch. It's a lunch. Jeremiah 15, 16, when your words came, I ate them. You know what I love about fellowship? 
We're a diet and exercise church. As you've heard me say a squillion times, and that's what the Bible says. The Bible says we eat the word of God, we feed on the word of God, the calories give us the energy to push away from the table and to do the stuff. And in the belt buckle of the Bible belt, as we all know, there's so many obese Christians. So many people have their Bible belt on the last hole, and it's just straining to hold that big old belly in because we've gone to a Bible study and this and another concert and a Bible study, and we've dissected this or that, and we've gone to this or that and that and this or this or that. Use and apply what you have learned and what you've known. So when your words came, I ate them. Think about my dog. The Doberman ate the word. We need to feed on the word. If this is your only feeding, you're in trouble. As you grow, you learn how to feed yourself. Little babies, we don't want them to stay little babies for the rest of their lives. We want them to learn how to feed themselves. And, and that's one of the amazing things too about Fellowship Church, we have a bunch of self-feeders. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. Wow, I love it. I, I spend a lot of time in the Bahamas and one of my favorite expressions down there is good morning this morning, I love that one. And another one they say is, man, you're doing fool. You're doing fool. So if I trust in myself, Proverbs 28, 26 says, I'm doing fool, doing fool. So the Bible is a love letter, it's a light, it's a lunch, it's also a life. It's a life. It's, it's, it's a zoo because this word living, I'm gonna read to you in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, is the Greek word zoo. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. No wonder people distort it and deny it and diss it. You see this everywhere we turn. And then of course, 2 Timothy 3, 16, talks about the scripture being God-breathed, God-breathed. So when we receive the breath of God, we have the life, the resurrection and the life. Jesus exhales on us and we have an opportunity to inhale his forgiveness and grace and his mercy. And once I do that, I'm born again. Watch this. March 16th, 1961, I came into the world, I breathed my first breath. Doctor slapped me on my bump, rump, bonky, whatever you want to call it, and I, and I took in my first breath. I was born. Okay. Then, I was born again when I inhaled the breath of Jesus as a young guy. And that's why I'm so thrilled to see children and students receive Christ. Because if you look at the stats, once a kid gets over 18 years of age, the percentage of them breathing in the breath of God goes down dramatically. So that's why I'm happy I made that decision as a kid, and I'm happy that so many of you did as well. I was born March 16th, 1961, then I was born again when I was a kid in church. So if I'm born twice, I die once. However, if I'm born once, I die twice. I die and then I spend eternity separate from Jesus. Have you been born again? Have you received the breath of God? Because this book, the Word of God, tells me how to breathe. I breathe in, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, yet in this world, the Bible says, we're in the world but not of the world. This is my oxygen tank. You know, I've, I've swam with sharks before. And I had to go down 50 feet 
to swim. And I'm not even certified. That was stupid, but I did it. <laughs> this aerator and the oxygen tank kept me alive underwater. I breathed in, <laughs> breathed out. This word teaches me, it shows me, it gives me life. It's like, it's like an oxygen tank as I'm swimming in this world. Without it, I'm shark food, I'm shark bait. So every single day, we've gotta take in the breath of God. We've gotta read the word of God. Now and then I hear someone say, yeah, God told me. Really? Really, God, God told you? Well, God's never gonna tell you anything that is contrary to his word. And so often, we're gonna pray about stuff that we shouldn't even pray about. It's already written in God's word. God has told us how to live, how to deal with the opposite sex, how to have the best friends the right day, how to get married, how to parent, how to handle our finances, how to deal with stress and anxiety. The Bible is the breath of God, the word of God, it's the oxygen. When I was in high school, my parents gave me a Bible. And when they gave me this Bible, I'll never forget it. Dad came in and he said, I wanna write something down in the front of your Bible. And dad has horrible penmanship. I mean, he, he does it right. You can't even, you can't even read anything. Yet he printed it, and here's what he said, and I'm gonna read it from my Bible. He said, when you read God's word, study it through, pray it in, live it out, and pass it on. You know, I, I've tried, as a follower of Christ, as someone who uses the Bible as an oxygen tank to live that out. I've tried. The breath, the recorded breath of God. Well, here's our homework, very simple. I'm gonna challenge you to just take 11 minutes a day, just 11, and find a place Begin with the book of John, read the Bible 11 minutes a day, and ask God this question, God, how can I apply this in my life? Begin to journal that. You do that for 30 days if your life is not transformed, if your breathing has not been totally resuscitated and changed, I'll do a somersault off this stage. Now some of you are going, well, I just don't, I just don't feel like the Bible is true. You know, I don't feel like the Bible is true. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. I mean, truth is true. I could go to New York right now and say, you know, I don't believe in the law of gravity, jump off the Empire State Building, Maybe Brad is on the 100th floor and he goes, Ed, how's this going? As I'm falling, and I can say, so far, so good, man. But I'm gonna hit the pavement. So you can say, ah, oh, you know, but try it. Try it. It will change your life. We're under the authority of God's word. Get under it. Meditate on it. Read it. Get to know it, study it through, pray it in, live it out, and pass it on. So maybe you feel like your life is just ripped apart. You've edited the Bible yourself. Once you begin this reading plan, I'm telling you, God will take all these pieces and put them in order. He will put them in order, and you can have 
the kind of oxygen tank that you need to live, breathe, and thrive in this environment. As you exit, we're going to give you a reading list of the book of John. 11 minutes a day, after you, then you read, you say, God, speak to me, apply this to my life. Find a place, a quiet place. You can sit still and just spend those 11 minutes. I promise you, you will be able to breathe. You'll have life and energy and purpose, and you'll see people in situations like you've never seen before. So let's give the first blast of offensive energy in the morning to the Lord. When we give him that first, he blesses the rest. So as you exit, we have those reading lists for you. Also, too, at our different resource centers, we have a reading list. If you want to learn more about the origins of our Bible, the translation of our Bible, if you really want to see some of those some of those things, or Tian Moon is a phenomenal teacher and her message is available on the Bible, on the specifics as far as the translation, the orientation, and the preservation of the Bible, please pick it up because I'm believing we're gonna have people who move from cynics to skeptics, from skeptics to seekers, from seekers to those who were rescued, who were saved by the breath of God. Also, too, make sure to check out University of Next Level. Our very own Dr. Tracy Barnes teaches classes on the validity and the beauty of Scripture. I'll see you guys next time as we continue to <sighs> breathe. Let's bow for prayer. God, I thank you that we have the freedom to worship you, and I thank you for your word that is sharper than a two-edged sword, that is a lion, that's tough and tender, but that is convicting. I thank you for giving us, for recording and revealing and maintaining this amazing book. I pray, God, that Every person here would begin to read the Bible, even if you're like, I'm not sure I believe it. You begin to read it, and I promise you, God will breathe on you. He will. So it's my prayer that we as a church, as we move through the book of John over the next 30 or so days, that, that we do this and that we start this daily discipline. For those here, Father, who maybe have ripped some pages out, who've become editors. God, may we understand that every word that you have breathed is for our best interests. Others here, Lord, if they have never, ever, ever been born again, they can receive your breath. You took your first breath when you were born, but it's time to take this supernatural breath of Jesus. You can do it right now by saying, Jesus, I want to, to receive your breath. I believe, just say that, that you lived and died and rose again. And at this time, I inhale the breath of life and resurrection that you exhaled. Even though I've got bad breath, Lord, I know you lean into it and you receive it. And I wanna walk in your breath. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.